Good afternoon. My name is Steve Hemminger. I'm Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Welcome to the Bay Area Metro Center. We are the conveners of CASA. And you might ask, well, why did you do that? <laughs> what does a convener do? I've been asking myself these questions. You know, the, on the honest answer, the honest answer to why we have convened CASA is that we are in deep trouble as a region, and we need your help. Uh, we'll be hearing a lot of factoids through this process. I'll start with my favorite one, uh, which I think really puts it in stark relief. Since 2010, the Bay Area has added over half a million new jobs, and we have produced 50,000 new housing units. That is not the road to sustainability by any stretch. We also aren't preserving enough of the affordable housing that already does exist. And we're doing a pretty lousy job of protecting current residents from displacement where neighborhoods are changing rapidly. When it comes to housing, in my opinion, we're failing on all fronts. With CASA, we have quite deliberately assembled a group of leaders who probably agree on 80% of the problem, but only 20% of the solution. We hope you are willing to close that gap by taking on some sacred cows and crossing some red lines. Some of those red lines may belong to MTC or ABAG, and if you think we deserve to be challenged, that's okay too. At the outset of our work together, I hope we can all agree on what Yogi Berra once said. If you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace. After decades of wandering, we have wound up in this housing crisis. And I think we should go someplace else. And to help us do that, uh, one of the jobs of Convener is to identify co-chairs. Um, and we have done that on your behalf. Uh, and I'll call them our three pathfinders, uh, who I hope will help us through this and guide the way. Uh, to my immediate left, Mike Covarrubias from TMG Partners. To his left, Fred Blackwell, in more ways than one, uh, from the San Francisco Foundation. And uh, at the far left, um, Leslie uh, Corselia from Silicon Valley at home. These are your co-chairs, again, uh, chosen because they don't necessarily agree about everything. Uh, but they are good citizens, um, and they're going to volunteer a whole lot of time um, to help get us through this and get us to a better place. So Fred, I think I turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everyone. Uh, my job is to kind of give you a little bit of a description of the goals for the uh, group and how we have assembled it. Uh, I am one of the three co-chairs, uh, as you can see up here, and we just got introduced, and I'm also uh, the guy that Mike whispers to throughout the meeting. Um, <laughs> Just a, a couple of things. Um, one is, I think the, the overarching goal for CASA is to come up with solutions uh, to the region's housing crisis uh, with a real strong emphasis on the region. Uh, I think uh, all of us come from uh, a variety of local jurisdictions, but the real focus for this group, uh, because we haven't been around a lot of these tables, is to really think about kind of what the solutions are at a Bay Area uh, level of scale. Um, when we are thinking about uh, solutions, we are really thinking about them uh, along two axes. Uh, on one axis, we're really talking about uh, the what uh, of what needs to be uh, attacked or addressed. And there are uh, the way that we are characterizing this is really revolving around three P's. One P being the need to uh, come up with strategies that address production. Uh, the second P uh, around the need to come up with uh, strategies that address preservation. Uh, and the third P really about strategies that uh, address the need for protection uh, along the way. Uh, and so that is one uh, way, part of the frame for us when we're thinking about solutions. The next axis really thinks about kind of what the buckets are in each one of those 
uh, peas. Uh, and there are three things that we are thinking about uh, in that regard as well. Legislative solutions across all three of those peas, financing solutions across all three of those peas, and solutions that really address uh, the local regulatory environment across all of those peas. So those are the things that we're focused in on. Um, as um, what Steve said a little bit earlier, um, we are also focused in on bringing folks to the table um, that agree on the problem but disagree about the solutions. One of the premises uh, that we bring to this as co-chairs, and I think uh, MTC would share this, and I think there are many others in the room that would agree, is that one of the things that's been holding us back from coming up with um, really solid solutions that we think are implementable uh, across a variety of issue areas is the fact that um, folks believe strongly in their area of work, whether that's a geographic area or they believe strongly in production or preservation or protection, but there have been very few places where a table has been set where there can be negotiation, there can be transactional conversations about what the highest common denominator is across all those areas. And to think about where there's agreement, where there are areas of disagreement, but we may be able to get to agreement, and areas where we just uh, can't come to agreement and where there are just deep, deep, deep disagreements around how we want to move forward. Our hope is that across the production, preservation, and protection areas of work and within the legislative, financing, uh, and local regulatory environment areas of work that we can reach a higher common denominator than the one that currently exists and that we can come up so with solutions that really address the problem at a regional level. The last thing I want to say is that this is one of two groups that is being convened under uh, the CASA umbrella. Uh, the first one uh, is a technical or expert uh, group uh, that is, looks like this but involves um, other folks. And it really is, that group is meeting monthly. It's about to break down into subcommittees. Uh, and its task is to kind of come up with the best big ideas and throw them over the fence to this group. Uh, and this group uh, would be the one that does further deliberation. And for the areas where there is agreement, we're hoping that we are able to use our political capital to actually get these things over the finish line. Uh, and so that is uh, really the way we're organized. The last thing I would say is that this group, um, I'm sure you'll all be happy to know, is not the group that meets monthly. Uh, this is a group that will meet uh, probably about four or five times over the next 12 to 18 months uh, less frequently because they're going to be kind of receiving stuff rather than actually doing the idea uh, generation. So I just wanted to provide that overview, and I think Leslie's going to uh, say a couple of things as well. Yes. Uh, thank you, Fred. Actually, Fred, uh, I think you covered my part, okay. so I All was right. going to talk about the Apologies. technical and steering committee. Um, but uh, we, we did meet earlier in this room with the steering committee for the third, or for the, uh, with the technical committee for the third time. And we are making some progress, and uh, we'll be bringing those ideas back to you. We'll be working over the next uh, couple of months on those ideas and bringing those back to you in January. So uh, I'll just hand it back over to Michael. Thanks. Um, and I'll just add on top of that the mottos that we have thrown out to the technical committee, because this is a lot of folks who come from various places, is to try to look at the greater good that we're all trying to get to. It's not just representing your own interests. We're going to have to try to get to a grand bargain at the end of the day. That's our two words we focus on. That means some give and take. And when we go through the scoring process, you'll see what that's intended to look like. And then I've been saying this morning that the, let perfection not be the enemy of the good. So we're going to get some good ideas, and we may run with them, uh, hopefully with a enough consensus that uh, it's something you all can support. But, uh, but that's kind of the big picture how we're trying to drive the technical conversation. So I have the privilege of introducing um, Scott Wiener. Scott is known to, I assume, everyone in the room as the uh, state legislator, uh, senator from the city and county of San Francisco and San Mateo County. 
Uh, I worked with him as a member of the Board of Soups, and he was always smart, passionate, and uh, able to get stuff done. So um, he missed a meeting, and they said, well, why don't you go try that in Sacramento, which uh, doesn't usually happen. And for all of you who know, the last week or so, or two or three, has been a monumental effort up there to get a housing package done. Scott led the way on some of the more challenging uh, measures, which he can tell us about. And uh, at the end of the day, I think they're still sitting on the governor's desk, but there's all indications that he will pass them en masse. And so um, in as much as he's sort of um, become one of the new leaders of the housing reform world, which is what we are all about, is trying to make reform and housing to get it done, it's appropriate that he would be here for our first steering committee meeting. So I want to introduce Scott and uh, give him a hearty thank you for what you've done so far. But uh, <laughs> give, it, give us your perspective of that place. Great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say it's good to be back in this building. I, I spent six years on the MTC before uh, heading up to Sacramento, and I, uh, I, I'll be honest, it's one of the things I miss the most about being in local government because uh, uh, our regional work, it's taken on just a greater and greater role, and it's, it's so real. Uh, and so I, I'm just really continuing, continually in awe of the work that happens regionally in the Bay Area. I think it's a model for the country uh, in a lot of ways. And a lot has changed since I first came on the MTC. I came, went on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in January of 2011, and then in May went on to the MTC. Uh, and back then, and it really wasn't that long ago, but it seems like it was a lifetime ago politically in terms of housing. Um, I still remember uh, you know, being on, on the Board of Supervisors and you'd have a controversial housing project and there was, other than the developer, and no offense to, to the developers, but there are limits to that advocacy, uh, there was almost no one even showing up in favor of housing. It was just opposition, opposition, opposition. When we did Plan Bay Area, and for those who were uh, part of that, it was a painful uh, process. And we had these weird things where the sort of the left and the right would come together all in the crusade of being opposed to housing. And everyone can always think, there's always an excuse, whether you're a progressive excuse or a conservative excuse, there's always an excuse not to do housing. And, and it just plays on itself and it ends up really harming low-income and middle-class people. Uh, and the last you know, four or five years, it's really, the dynamic has just shifted uh, in a very, very tangible way. And you know, this is one of those situations where the people um, I think fundamentally, I don't mean the people who um, are showing up at every planning commission hearing. I mean the people broadly are way ahead of where policymakers are. People get it that we don't have enough housing. They get it that when you create a ton of jobs and erect obstacle after obstacle after obstacle uh, in the way of housing, that that is harmful. It's intuitive to people, it's common sense, and they get it. And so we need to play catch up, and we're starting to do that so that we are where the people are. Uh, and we are, uh, I think the political dynamic is there. Um, you know, the number of times uh, in, over the course of this year with SB 35, where we had the League of California Cities having an absolute meltdown for the entire year and trying to flame everyone up, the number of times that local city council members from around the state including from small communities, would come up to me and say, you know what, I can't say this publicly, but I'm so grateful for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing to try to make it easier to approve housing. Uh, because we have a situation where a lot of local elected officials um, you know, really do get it fundamentally, but feel handcuffed uh, in terms of their political future, in terms of the dynamic in their community, and that's where we have to help. Uh, we did, I think, a really good thing in the legislature uh, this year, and I want to thank everyone. There are a lot of people in this room who helped make that happen. And you know, the governor has 15 bills on his desk. He's indicated he's going to sign all of them, uh, and I think it's going to happen very, very soon. Uh, and uh, they fall into a couple of a few categories. One, uh, you know, I had the honor of authoring SB 35 uh, that will actually put teeth in the arena and say, if you're not meeting your arena goals, we're going to help you meet your arena goals by turning housing, whether it is lo for low-income people, for moderate income, 
market rate, whatever you're missing your, uh, re not meeting your arena goals, whatever category you're not meeting your arena goals, will become streamlined. That means, means it's a ministerial permit. And we were able to build a coalition, even though that takes these projects out of CEQA entirely, a coalition of environmentalists, of affordable housing uh, nonprofit developers, uh, of labor, uh, of business, broad coalition to get that done. And we will finally have teeth in RENA. Um, we have uh, the most significant affordable housing funding package uh, that anyone can remember, particularly uh, uh, you know, removing redevelopment. The state has just been negative toward affordable housing. The state is finally starting to turn that around. Uh, and it's only the beginning. We need a lot more state funding into affordable housing. Uh, we uh, passed a number of uh, bills uh, to stop the scamming of the housing element process. No more of this, you know, I know there's a, a shopping center there that's, that's not going anywhere, but that's where we're going to put our low-income housing, in that already developed area that's never, ever, ever going to be developed. No more of that. We strengthened the Housing Accountability Act uh, so that uh, communities that are tempted to arbitrarily deny projects, to arbitrarily downzone, there will actually be enforceability and penalties for doing that. Uh, so we strengthened laws that were on the books that had no real enforcement, and then we added new tools in terms of funding and streamlining. Uh, but it's really important to be clear that this package, as important as it was, uh, I like to describe it as a healthy down payment. This is a first step, and, and sometimes a concern that I sometimes have in the legislature, uh, and I have the same concern with SB1, our transportation funding measure, is this, this temptation to say, okay, we checked the box, we're done, we did housing. I don't want to deal with that anymore, it was too painful. And we can't allow my, the legislature to do that, we can't allow, uh, this governor I don't think needs much persuasion, but whoever the next governor is, we have to be clear that housing is, if not the number one issue, then among the top, top issues facing the state. Um, we know that it's harming our environment. We know that it is tearing families apart. Uh, we know that it is going to really harm our economy um, as employers decide they don't want to expand here because their workers can't find housing. And we need to hold the legislature and the governor accountable, all of us, to keep doing more. Uh, and we have more work uh, that we can do. Uh, next year, we're going to be doing more uh, housing work. It might not be get as much attention as it got this year. It might not be as sexy. But we have work to do. We have to reform RENA. RENA is broken. It's overly politicized. It has no correlation to what our actual housing needs are in terms of how it's set up. It's not a criticism of anyone who does RENA. It's such a hyper-politicized process, and it needs to be more data-based, and that'll help everyone in this room. Uh, we have just a lot more work to do, and we're going to do that. And so, the, but the other piece of that um, is we have to keep, I think, in my view, shifting the political dynamic. Uh, we need to make it easier for local elected officials to cast votes in favor of housing. And I think the dynamic is there when you look at the broad population. The more people we get engaged in the process, we shift that dynamic. We need to give cover to people in elected office who are making these hard decisions. Uh, we also, uh, I, the, the Bay Area has such a huge role to play because even though this is a statewide problem, we are at the epicenter, the Bay Area can play a really significant role in piloting and trying new things in terms of how to get more housing done more quickly, but continuing to push the legislature. So I look forward to partnering with this region uh, to come up with new ideas that we move at a state level, to support efforts that you're doing at a local and a regional level, and to really move forward together because there's so much more work to do. So thank you for everything, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful, productive meeting today. We're just chatting among ourselves. Jennifer, are you next? Yes, I am. <laughs> well done. Actually, uh, Ken's going to join me, uh, so we have gender balance. Um, so at, at this point, uh, we actually want to, and, and we've got about 45 minutes uh, for this, to really hear from everybody in the room sort of on 
your reflections on the CASA process and what you've heard and also your expectations and aspirations for CASA in, in terms of how we deliver the full value. And we're gonna start with Mayor Lee and then with Mayor Schaff and then we're gonna go around the table. Uh, and so we have a couple of minutes for each person, uh, but Mayor Lee, we're here in your city uh, and we're gonna give you the honor of starting. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming today and MTA and of course Michael and Fred and Leslie, thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's a wonderful day to be here in this very un-Mark Twain day that we have in San Francisco. And I'm glad to be here with my colleagues uh, and all the other elected officials in the counties of surrounding. I think this is absolutely necessary. Um, we've been struggling with housing. It's been pretty much my focus ever since day one, uh, six and a half years ago, uh, when we authored the, uh, the Housing Trust Fund to begin more than a conversation, the actual economic foundation for building more affordable housing, particularly for our low income communities that were suffering. But I, I'd be honest that uh, the real focus for me these days, although I think we're doing much better on the very deep affordability challenges that we have, uh, whether it's veterans, whether it's lowest income or immigrant families, I'm essentially concerned about the losing and the requiring of our essential workforce to travel uh, two hours, two and a half hours from their homes to get to a place where they're gonna help me stop fires, uh, prevent crime, uh, repair utilities after a disaster, uh, get my 911 dispatchers having a hard time. And these are all working folks, they're teachers, they're restaurant workers, they're the heads of nonprofits that can't get into our city because they're living too far away trying to find some sense of affordability. And they make adequate money, but they can't afford the prices because we haven't built enough and we haven't concentrated on this level of the essential uh, working class, the, th the, the people who actually make our cities run, uh, in my estimate. And I'm committed to try to get that even more pronounced done and more housing for that middle income working class folks. I have a good conversation going with all of our labor leaders uh, because I don't want them to be traveling two and a half hours to get to the work that they really want to do and do well. Uh, so that's my focus, and uh, I'm talking to developers. Uh, I think we're not going to have a whole bunch of no's, but it's how to do it. And uh, I'm issuing an executive directive uh, this afternoon uh, to all of our departments to really cut our processes in half. I know Senator Weiner is absolutely right because he worked with me very closely on all these projects and we understood all the challenges and now he's able to identify those things that are really at the state level that we can comp complement the local level. I look forward to working with uh, the mayors, uh, county council leadership, labor leaders to really push forward uh, housing for the essential workforce because if, I, if we don't do that, our cities are gonna be bogged down uh, with everything, and I have to look at the next earthquake uh, as we are reviewing what's happened in southern United States and uh, Puerto Rico and other places that we've got to be recovering today before the events happen, and this is why we have to have emergency and essential workforces in our cities or close enough by they're not wasting time sitting on bridges or, or backed up by cars of people that are full. Thank you, Mayor Lee. Mm -hmm. We're now gonna go just across the bay uh, and hear from Mayor Libby Schaff of Oakland. All right, across the bay and across the table. Um, it really is phenomenal that you have convened this conversation and you um, have all the right people around the table and in the room. Um, my reflection is more around that we have to stop talking about housing because it evokes lumber and nails and and maybe talk, start talking about shelter or something where we remember that really what we're talking about is, is people, families, communities. Um, Oakland is experiencing this displacement crisis and a fear of displacement crisis. We've seen um, our median rents increase 25% while income has increased only 5% in the last couple of years. And so, you know, when I hear these stories like uh, the football 
coach at Castlemont High School lost five of his players in a single year, in a single season. Because when someone loses their housing in Oakland, they cannot find new housing in Oakland. I have a city where the majority of the people who currently live in my city could not afford to move into my city. So for the people who have not been di displaced, everyone is living with a fear of displacement as they see rents around them go up and know what they're paying. And yet the market forces, um, it, it is unreasonable for people to see how much money they can make on a new vacant apartment and be stuck with a different rate of return. And so there is something that is seriously broken. <clears throat> but I do hope that we continue to think about people. The disruption to a family that loses their housing it is just devastating. And so um, I think traditionally we've always thought just about building more, <clears throat> and this is a more complicated problem than that. So I thank you for the leadership. Um, again, Steve, you did well on choosing your co-chairs, and um, I look forward to uh, having the political will and strength to take on some of the sacred cows and to have a really authentic and brave conversation about, I mean, this is not just the future of the Bay Area. This, I mean, we are the economic engine for California and arguably the country. And so we've got to get this right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Schaff. So we're gonna start on this side of the room and just go around and again, uh, your expectations uh, and aspirations for the process and you've got it. We wanna make sure everybody uh, speaks into the mic and has your mic on. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Arian Hogan. I am with Genentech. Um, we're really excited to be part of this process and to be in this room with this amazing brain trust of folks coming from a variety of different perspectives. This is something that we've imagined for a long time because Genentech's been here for 40 years. We've always known that housing prices in the Bay Area region are incredibly expensive, but what we're seeing now is unprecedented and it's starting to impact from at least our perspective um, the ability to attract and retain talent in the region. Um, and we're not just talking at kind of the baseline levels. I mean, we're talking at our scientist levels. We're talking at, um, at, at salary ranges that people, most people would think they should be able to afford housing in the region. And so we're very excited to be here to tackle this very serious problem with all of you. Thank you. My name is Bob Alvarado. I'm with the uh, Northern California Carpenters. Um, <clears throat> I'm also uh, very excited and honored uh, to be part of this group. Uh, I think my my expectations um, of the group, um, you know, we're going to um, get, like you said, the, the technical committee is going to throw stuff over the fence and, and we're going to look at it. So, uh, you know, I respect the makeup of the technical committee. I think... Um, that uh, there may be a lot of, of very good ideas. I think, you know, housing, I've been a, a carpenter for 44 years. 44 years ago, I was building houses. And I built houses for 10 years before I, I started running work. Um, back then, uh, a release was, uh, you know, when you're building a phase, nowadays you look at a phase and it's five or 10 houses. Back then, a release was 150, 200 houses. You know, we had tracks that were 11, 1,200 houses that were then um, in a suburb or, or bedroom community, but are now pretty much part of downtown San Francisco. You know, um, getting here, again, is putting them back to a bedroom community or even the outland for that matter. Uh, but I'm looking forward to, um, to trying to solve really uh, an age old problem um, hopefully with not age-old solutions. I think we need to look at, uh, at more creative ways of both um, production and delivery. You know, when, when we talk about sacred cows, obviously I represent uh, one of the most sacred cows, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, and so, but I bring something to the table. You know, labor brings something to the table. We, we represent folks that, uh, that do every day, 
you know, and, and I like to say this when, when we, for each new graduating class of apprentices. Developers have dreams, architects have dreams, engineers have dreams. With two hands, a heart, and a brain, we make dreams come true. You can't penalize those folks. Um, you know, as somebody said earlier, that the wages are going down. You know, when we talk about affordable housing, those folks that build your housing are, are part of that class. You know, and so when you talk about about taking that down even farther, so now you're looking you're looking at a at a person who has a pretty much a middle class job with no hope of even participating, even sometimes in the rent, let alone purchasing uh, a product that they're working on. So we've got to find other ways. Um, you know, like I said, and I'm here uh, sitting in this chair with an open mind. Um, and I'm gonna, later on when we get into it, I want to talk about, about the different things that we're looking at uh, to try to improve the delivery and the production and the, and the protection. So thank you for inviting me to participate and I look forward to the process. Dave Cortezzi, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and um, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, ABAG, et cetera. Um, I hope big, bold ideas uh, come out of this and particularly come out of the technical um, advisory group. I don't really know what the composition of that is. I saw the folks meeting here earlier, but I hope it's um, uh, not the same old recent thinking um, that we can patch and cobble this together with a little bit more bond financing and a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that because um, we have a monumental task, of course, that people have already spoken to that um, is uh, causing um, enormous problems. Um, there's a couple of, of counties and cities here who I think have either led or, or matched our county in terms of our uh, tremendous housing efforts over the past couple of years, and yet um, we have um, a dramatic increase in uh, 25 and under homelessness in our county just in the last two years from 25% of our homelessness, which we thought was um, shameful, to one-third of our homeless population, which is, of course, um, um, almost an absurdity. Um, that That is directly... That there's a direct corollary between that increase in the skyrocketing cost of, of rental housing and the unavailability of rental housing. If you go back, I was building housing, rental housing, 25 years ago. Um, I wasn't quite doing it 40 years ago. But 25 years ago, the big ideas were coming out of the federal government. I don't think that's going to happen right now. Um, those were tax incentives, um, uh, the use, the liberal use of tax-exempt bond financing for multifamily housing that cut the cost down. Um, the, the liberal uh, tax laws that allowed, it, allowed passive investors, um, doctors, dentists, and people like that who weren't builders to put money in, who encouraged AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust to, to buy into to bonds that were um, at favored federal tax rates. Um, those things are all gone, and I don't think they're coming back. RDA is gone, and we know it's not coming back anytime soon. And we're doing what we can at the county level to pass big bonds and to do self-help measures. But what needs to come out, I think, of this group is how do we do what used to incent or incentivize, whichever word is in the dictionary now, um, how, how do we do what used to spur, what used to create the, the fuel for that private sector development um, the matching dollars. Um, we see it in the ELI. I'm looking at Matthew Franklin across the way. With, with this ELI bond, we can now match uh, nonprofit and, and private developers who want to build extremely low-income housing for the homeless. We don't have a tool like that uh, locally, and I don't think there's one in the region. And again, at the risk of being redundant, there's certainly not one at the federal level um, that creates um, the, the, the motivation for people who actually want to make money, who would like to build housing, who would like to work on those projects um, to get underway. So th that's a huge, <laughs> that's a, that, it's gonna take huge, big, bold thinking to figure out how at a regional level you replicate those tools that we used to have available to us uh, at other levels of government. 
uh, I do appreciate Senator Weiner's uh, efforts because, as he indicated, it was uh, certainly a huge step in the right direction at the state level. Thank you. So, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dave Reagan. I'm with SEIU United Healthcare Workers West. Um, we are an organization of a uh, hundred thousand hospital workers who work across the state, but a, a very significant portion here in the Bay Area. Um, unlike a lot of people in this room, I am a novice at uh, housing policy, but I, I read recently, and I think it was in the Chronicle, um, that one third of renters, or excuse me, one half of renters in the Bay Area are now spending over 50% of their income in rent, and a third of renters in Los Angeles are spending over 50% of their income in rent. Um, and frankly, that's all I need to know. That's, that's enough. Um, this is only not sustainable. It is a monumental problem, and it is counterproductive in the extreme. Uh, and, um, you know, as was said earlier, 500,000 new jobs, 50,000 new housing units, we have an order of magnitude problem. Um, this is not about, and, and I, I know some of the people who are on the technical committee, and they are incredibly capable and able and experienced people. Um, and here's what I think the truth is about the process. Um, if we ask them to solve a problem that addresses 10% of the problem, they can do that. And if we ask them to address a quarter of the problem, they can do that. And if we ask them to address the whole of the problem, they can do that. Um, and we have to decide, like, are we going to demand an order of magnitude solution? Um, if we demand an order of magnitude solution, and I don't just mean the people in this room, but I mean the Bay Area generally, we will get an order of magnitude solution. Um, and so, you know, process is good and it's essential, but I think the, the real mission here is what do we expect of ourselves and are we going to continue to watch this catastrophe um, play out? And... Uh, that to me is the core question. And so, you know, every year we fall another 100,000 units of housing short in the state of California, whatever the proportion is in, here in the Bay Area. And so we're going to spend 18 months talking about this. We'll be 200,000 more units in the hole by the end of that 18 months. And so the order of magnitude problem is going to get amplified even more. So, um, this is, I, I'm a newcomer to California. I've been here for nine years, and I came from Ohio, where when I left, I lost money on a house I had owned for seven years, and what I got in the transaction cannot get me a closet in the Bay Area. And so, frankly, I was saying to someone earlier today, it is amazing to me that people aren't, like, you know, tearing the state down over what's happening here. And so... You know, I know we all talk about urgency. I, all, I agree with Mayor Schaff about there are real people here. You, there is real deprivation out there among millions of people. And it's just, so we need to demand an order of magnitude solution. That's why I'm here and I'm pleased to be here and I hope that that's what we're about because incrementalism will not work and it hasn't worked. Good afternoon, Ellen Wu with Urban Habitat. Um, thank you for inviting um, me to the table. Uh, Urban Habitat was founded over 25 years ago, the need for um, people of color to pr be participating in um, the environmental movement. Um, we are a regional uh, policy advocacy organization that centers race and class on uh, around our transportation, land use, and, and um, housing policies um, and I guess I would say that I hope in following um, Dave's comments that we start with the most emergent emergency um, problem and that is the displacement that's happening um, of our communities and we know that renters are actually those at most risk for displacement 
So I, I hope that the technical advisory committees are really focusing on the most urgent um, and priority need at, at this moment um, and prioritizing protection, um, tenant protections and anti-displacement. Um, I also want to add that, um, you know, MTC has been charged several years ago around SB 375 to address climate change and climate crisis. Um, and we're in the second iteration of our Plan Bay area. And this last round, um, you all approved an action plan in conjunction with that. And it's good to see that the action plan and Plan Bay area aligns with CASA. But I hope that the CASA process does not hold up any implementation that can happen around the action plan. So again, this kind of urgency um, and uh, timeliness uh, needs to continue. I'm Grace Krennick and general manager at BART. Um, I'm very pleased to be here as uh, part of the regional fabric that's here. Um, I, I think uh, my uh, goal would be to, or my urge would be to make sure we get the big and the small right, uh, that we need to be very bold and answer the big question. And I think I heard that from the last couple of speakers, so Dave, Dave and Ellen. Um, we also need to, I think, break down the problem so that it's manageable and can be described to the public and to every city council that's out there. Um, it, for Bart, from Bart's point of view, uh, Plan Bay Area calls for about 38% of the jobs, I think, and about 34% of the housing to be located within the BART, uh, a half mile of a BART station. Um, and for us, we, we have to worry about the ridership issue on a day-to-day -day basis. But our board has made a commitment to housing and to affordable housing uh, to make, uh, we have, um, I think, 20,000 acres, um, excuse me, 250 acres, but scheduled maximize our potential to build 20,000 units in the Bay Area. Of those, the commitment is to 35% affordable units. Um, and so if you start through some of the math and do the economics uh, of that, the truth is we need to build 270 units a year if we're to meet the Plan Bay Area goal by 2040 and maximize what BART can contribute. I, I want to get specific with the numbers for a minute. So <clears throat> from BART's point of view, those 270 units with you, when you take into all the economics of it and what's needed subsidies, we're still short $36.5 million a year, uh, a year just for this housing issue, just to subsidize the affordable housing. That has nothing to do with the transit system itself and what it needs to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis. And we just passed a big bond to fix the most mundane parts of the system. But the reason we did is because Plan Bay Area calls for us to not just be around between now and then, but also to carry this added lift of the growth that's coming to our area and that added ridership that's within the, within the half mile. And it's the cheapest way for us to do it in the Bay Area. And so that, that tie between housing and transportation, our board gets it, we get the obligation, and we've been breaking down the commitment um, but the policies that are in place, I, I think there's 27 cities in the Bay Area and they have 27 different sets of policies for us to negotiate through. And uh, frankly, the conversation usually starts with, um, gee, we've got uh, one and two story housing units located next to your place, so we don't wanna go very high. So is two stories okay with you, Grace? You know, We can't get to those numbers for the big plan that the whole Bay Area has without busting that mindset that's there. And we have to work with our cities. I'm not trying, talking about imposing something that's something about BART. We're part of the regional plan and we have to work with the cities and the counties to figure out what can work. But we do have some areas, and the reason it's important that is because um, Dave mentioned the 50% um, of your budget goes, but for the very poor, when you add up transportation and housing together, it's, it's, it's close to 70% if not higher, of their budget that's going to transportation and housing. So it's real smart of us to put as many as close to the station as we can because their transportation options are much greater and a family and individuals are really liberated to participate in the economy as well as recreation and everything else by being close to transit. So I, I think I'm the only transit provider here and uh, I know that VTA also has 200 acres close and they've made a pr uh, commitment to 35%. So keeping that tie there is important. The reason I walk through our numbers is because we're just such a small part of this bigger table that's here, but if we break it down to know who has to do what, we can deal with the reality of it. So, you know, at the end of this process, I think we need the very big, and I think we need the numbers there 
and for the numbers, we need to start talking to the public about what it means. And I'm here also as an employer because what it means is for the people that are working that do have jobs, and BART jobs are good jobs. My folks are living in Tracy, and, and they're making the commute because that's what they can afford. So we, we, uh, these are people that are employed that are stretching themselves, and the mayor was talking about bringing employment in. That capacity is something that we have to worry about as a region. So we're here. We want to support the effort, and I really think you need the very bold ideas out there to bust through things. We need to make the statement and get people to get behind us, but translate it so that individuals understand the nature of the problem, neighborhoods and city councils. Thank you. I'm Julie Combs from the city of Santa Rosa, California, and I will give you a little brief on why I think I might be here as well. Um, Santa Rosa is the fifth largest city in the Bay Area, and per the Bay Area Plan 2040, we will be one of the fastest growing. Uh, I'm currently the vice chair of the Regional Planning Committee from ABAG and the chair of the Regional Planning Housing Subcommittee. That housing subcommittee has been composed of elected officials, uh, planners, business folks, builders of affordable housing and affordable housing interests. And we have had conversations similar, uh, but I think without the added oomph that this board will have. So I am delighted uh, to get to participate and to uh, bring forward both a perspective of the North Bay and a perspective from the Regional Planning Committee Housing Subcommittee. Um, in Santa Rosa, we've been embracing uh, our growth we are working on a 23-point housing action plan. We want to use all of the tools in the toolbox to get housing built in our area. Um, I personally also have a very strong interest in the three Ps and was, was glad to hear it brought up here in the way it was and would like to echo that I am particularly interested in first, how do we protect our people from displacement? Uh, as we build and construct housing that is market rate and we watch the housing prices climb and we watch the rents climb, we see people being displaced. We have in Santa Rosa some 15,000 back-of-house restaurant workers. They make more on average than restaurant back-of-house workers make in the United States, but they still can't afford to live here. And they're, they're commuting, and we don't have BART. So we are struggling to keep our numbers. We, we are very proud in Sonoma County that we have about 70% of our population that lives and works in the same county. And that's remarkable for the Bay Area. We would like to keep that. And what we are seeing is our people being driven out so that our commute numbers will be higher. On the RPC Housing Com Subcommittee, we've emphasized three areas. Uh, how to reconcile some of the concerns and issues that are involved with preserving the unique qualities of, lo of local small towns, residences, local small town feel uh, with buy right construction. How do we work through those, the tension of those two issues? Um, We've talked a lot about how to assist small cities in planning because if they can establish good planning in advance, uh, they may be more able to handle buy right construction. Um, we've looked at jobs and housing connections, um, inclu including in that some ideas such as having RENA swaps so that the town that has the work has the housing and the smaller other communities perhaps work together to have the housing be built in the bigger city and figuring out how to do that and yet still be diverse in population in both locations. Um, we're very interested in funding and funding of production with an emphasis on how to fund the deep affordable units, the units that are below 80%. All the stuff we as a city can do to stimulate housing construction, permits, streamlining, all that stuff, we can do a lot and are doing a lot to get the 80%, 100%, 120% AMI units built. Builders can build those if we work with them. 
but that market, no market is really going to build the below 50% AMI units, the 30% AMI units, the units our homeless need to go into. Um, in order for us to build those units going to directly to the numbers, um, we would need about $40 million a year over the next 10 years just to build the units that we need. My little city, my, my only fifth largest city. That's a lot to invest. We can't do that with a quarter cent sales tax. Uh, how we do the bond, how we fund, uh, for the most part, uh, the North Bay has been ineligible for grants from MTC and ABAG because we don't have BART and having a transit node has been a key to those. So I'm very interested in how we work together. We have very similar problems, needs, and concerns. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to represent uh, s some of the smaller cities and the North Bay. Thank you. So uh, I'm Jeremy Madsen. I'm the CEO of Greenbelt Alliance. And you know, I think back to when I think it was Fred who called me and asked me to be on this, this committee. And the very first thing that ran through my head is that saying, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and I think that's the situation we're in right now. I moved to the Bay Area in 1996. Housing affordability, I think, has always been a problem. Um, and the, the, the scale and the scope of the crisis right now is unlike we've ever had before. And I think what that does is it's bringing us all together. Um, and you know, people who just a few years ago might have differed on what the problem was, definitely differed on what the solution is, are now you know, starting to think, as I think Steve said, you know, we're getting closer to 80% on the same page. And I, I think that's exciting. And so I think the, the comprehensiveness of the agenda that we've got laid out here is very exciting. I, I, I love the three Ps. I love the fact that we're thinking about legislation. We're thinking about financing. We're thinking about local regulation. Um, I think if we think in those, all of those buckets, we, we have a chance. Um, but I will say, you know, I bumped into uh, one of the technical committee people leaving here today. I'm not going to out who it was. Um, and I asked him after, you know, three meetings, how are we doing? And uh, his, it was a him, so that narrows it down. Um, uh, his response was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. I think in a couple of the buckets, we might have a couple things that will get us a little bit of the way. And my response back is, all right, I think our job is to take it to, we're in all the buckets, uh, we're making big progress, and I think, you know, Dave, you just gave me my, my favorite new thing of the day, uh, order of magnitude solutions. You know, we're really stepping up and doing the work that needs to be done at the scale that needs to be done to, uh, to make an impact. Um, all that said, I will say, I think, um, uh, and, and I think Grace said it a second ago, the, the word manageable, I think, is a good one. Um, there's a lot of solutions I think we can put on the table that um, that'll be great, and with the right amount of money and the right amount of time, you know, 50 years from now, we'll, we'll, we'll reach that solution. Um, I'd love to see us going forward with things that are really pushing the envelope, taking it to scale, and that we can walk out of this process in a few months, or even as Ellen was saying, uh, you know, sooner, if we find things that actually can be done now, um, and start implementing and, and, and making immediate progress. Uh, you know, I think, Michael, you said enemy should not, uh, perfect should not be the enemy of the good. Um, last thing I'll say is, you know, so I'm from Greenbelt Alliance. I think I'm the only person on the committee that, you know, quote unquote, brings the environmental hat. Uh, we are all about making sure the right kind of development happens in the right places. Um, I sometimes joke internally, you know, we're the, we're the most pro-development environmental group you're gonna run across. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think we should really be thinking in those terms of where do we want to see development happen? What kind of development should that be? Um, how do we do that development in a way that deals with and is sensitive to the displacement, the affordability issues, um, and that, uh, you know, we're, we're handling and being true to what's laid out in Plan Bay Area, um, to the, uh, what makes the Bay Area a special place to our contribution and our uh, contribution to solving the, the climate crisis. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think at the same time, this idea of there are sacred, some sacred cows that are gonna be gored, we need to, need to think about what those cows are. Um, it should be easier to develop the right thing 
in our cities and towns um, and uh, uh, if we're going to protect uh, the places that we want to see development not happen. And I think that's one thing we should put on the table. I know right now it's hard to develop um, in what I consider to be the wrong places, and it's even harder to develop in the places that I consider to be the right places. Um, so let's make that easier. Um, last thing I'll quickly say, and again, I think it builds off something that somebody else said. Um, I, part of the reason I'm really excited to be here is I think we have an opportunity to really be a model. You know, you look across not just California, but you look across the country, we've got um, you know, a political climate where people are pitted against each other, you know, that, whether it's developers and business leaders against social equity advocates and environmentalists or, or, or whatever it is. Um, this is exciting to see a room that is, you know, the developers, the business leaders, uh, equity advocates like Ellen, environmentalists like me, um, uh, you know, the elected leaders of the, the region, the three mayors of the big cities who have, you know, many, many important things to be doing, and they're here, at least two of them are here right now. Um, and I'll take that up with Sam. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I think, you know, this is, this is about, while this is all about the Bay Area, this is about more than the Bay Area, and I think that's exciting. I'm here because Steve Heminger told me to be here as the chair of MTC. And uh, I'm very proud to be the chair of MTC. My name is Jake McKenzie. And uh, just happen to have with me hard copy, Plan B Area 2040, and sitting to my right, uh, who will be introducing herself uh, all by herself, is the president of ABAG. And, uh, We've signed off on a couple of documents this year. One has been the merger of ABAG and MTC staff coming together, uh, which I would say is a, a very significant happening. And at the same time, uh, we jointly approved Plan B Area 2.0 or, or 2040. And that comes out of being a sustainable community strategy and talks to the overarching goals of SB 375, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, which brings into play uh, all of the aspects of what's going, what has to happen in our region to, to bring about uh, some reaction to climate change. And by looking at not just the building of housing and the juxtaposition of jobs and housing uh, and how we get from these two places, one to the other, but also talks about conservation. But um, I'm, I'm wearing my hat also as mayor of the city of Rohnert Park. We are not the fifth largest city in the Bay Area. We're the third largest city in Sonoma County. We're a wee city of 42,000 people. I would disagree with my colleague from Santa Rosa. We sit on a transit system. It's known as SMART. It's operating. It's going up and down the 101 corridor. It's based on a Peter Calthorpe idea that transit-oriented development would happen in the 101 corridor along the railroad tracks. And people are commuting. I agree with your data, absolutely. About 20% of the people commute out from Sonoma County as opposed to the rest who can still commute from Santa Rosa to Petaluma by rail now. But I think the important thing is this concept of uh, cities, nine cities in Sonoma County, each of them have voter approved urban growth boundaries. We have general plans, we have arena numbers, and in Runner Park, since the year 2000, we have entitled 4,200 housing units. Uh, we have a growth management ordinance which says that uh, 225 housing units um, per year can be built. And I'm here to report to you, and others have heard this story, from 2000 to 2016, we built zero housing units. We started seeing uh, sticks going up vertically last year. So of these 4,200 housing units, uh, roughly now about 215 housing units have actually been built, and we're now in pro process of using our specific plans, of using development agreements, with developers to move forward. And why, you ask, uh, did it take so long? Well, you all know the answer to that. The recession, the Great Recession of 2008, hit right about the time when these developers, having gotten their entitlements, were looking to finance the building of houses. And it came to a screeching halt. And I've talked to 
uh, people like Brookfield Homes, and they were having to get corporate approval to get the financing to start building these houses in 2016. It wasn't recalcitrance on the part of the city council of Roanoke Park. We had everything in place. It was this disconnect between financing, uh, the, world of, the world of finance and uh, the actual building of these houses. Now this has an impact also on uh, this coming together of jobs, housing and transportation. We would run more trains than SMART already, but we've lost operators already because they come out of Miami, they come out of Atlanta, they come out of different Denver, they come out of different places, and they think, gosh, this is a great salary to, to, to run these nice new DMUs with the green and gray. They're back home. They cannot afford to live in Sonoma County. And so um, we, we have these problems. Others of you have mentioned it. These are very practical examples um, from where I come from. And the last thing I'll say is, as uh, I've been on the council for 21 years now, we've gone close to having to declare bankruptcy. Our general plan called for us, uh, as we build these new housing units, they're going to be in a different taxation structure so that we can continue to provide the services that we provide to the rest of Rohnert Park. So we have a two taxation class society that is starting to grow in Rohnert Park because they're in Melarus districts or development districts involving financing plans where not only are they paying property tax, they are, are also paying taxes to maintain um, the landscaping and uh, the infrastructure around them. So the world that we're, we're living in, and I suspect that most of you know this, is that for cities to continue to provide services, we have to look for means to uh, finance them. We're accused of, you know, um, exorbitant permit fees. There are reasons for permit fees, and there are reasons for these taxation structures to continue to offer the amenities that people who buy these houses expect. So I could go on and on, and I won't, so thank you very much. As Jake mentioned, I am Julie Pierce. I'm the president of the Association of Bay Area Governments, and together with MTC, charged with putting together Plan Bay Area 1 and 2. The first one was agony. The second one was was somewhat painful at times, but certainly far better. And I think we have a much better, more collaborative uh, product with an action plan that will help us to actually make a start, at least, on achieving some of these goals. Um, I'm also a council member of 25 years on the city council for the city of Clayton, which is about 4,100 people, or 4,100 homes, 11,000 people. And we are further out in the East Bay. We are almost to East Contra Costa County, um, but it's a fairly affluent area. It's a bedroom community. We have nine acres in our incorporated area that is not built upon already, either by existing neighborhoods or very, very small commercial grocery store, that kind of thing, very essential service type things. A thriving uh, shopping center, not one that is vacant and needing to be rehabilitated, but one that is absolutely essential services to keep people from driving more than a few miles for their, for their necessary things. But it's also the kind of community where um, we want our children to be able to come back home and raise their families there. And most of our kids can't afford to do that. Um, it's, it's something I think that's one of our, all of our goals. We wanna have that continuity of family and community. But right now, they usually can't. We also have a need for housing for seniors so that they are not trapped in their pre-Prop 13 homes. We have many folks who raised their families in the neighborhood, for instance, that I'm in, which was built in 1964. Many of those original owners are still there because they can't afford to go anywhere else. 
because the property taxes would kill them. So that's another challenge we need to add to this list of affordability for homes. Um, I think we need to, to broaden this, that we need homeless housing, we need to preserve what we have, we need to protect the existing infrastructure, we need to develop new. All of those things are really, really necessary. We need housing for all income levels because as we know that as people progress through their careers, they can afford different things. They start out with a little tiny apartment and then they wanna go into something to raise their family and then eventually when they retire, they need some place to go to so they don't have to take care of that traditional family lot, but they wanna be in the community where they've lived their entire lives. And most of our communities don't have that kind of housing for seniors. If we could get that kind of housing for seniors, then the younger families can move into the housings that they would vacate, which is a sort of a continuum of housing that we all need to provide. Um, speaking to the political will, I hear a lot, how come councils won't vote for things? I think frequently the political will is there. I think the problem is the political cover is usually not. Um, all the naysayers will show up but those in favor rarely come to a meeting. Um, and if they do, they're, they're tagged as the token environmentalist or the token housing person. Um, and they're usually from outside the community, which means they're outsiders telling our community how they should build. I think we need that visible support but I think we also need to change the culture by educating our community, by making it okay for community members to stand up and say, I want housing my kids can grow up in, that my grandchildren can come back to this community where we can all be close. I think those are real essential things we need to accomplish. Now, how do we get there? We need the financial tools for jurisdictions, I think, to put together the plans in advance with their community that provides the kind of housing that fits that community, that addresses all those different needs, the younger families, the singles, the seniors, and help our community understand that in order to maintain that family cohesiveness, we've got to provide the products for everybody. Having that planning money ahead of time to put together the specific plans, which most of us do not have these days. The, the funds are not there. We used to be able to use uh, redevelopment money for these kinds of things, and, and that's not available. But the new legislation has included some of those kinds of grants. If we can do that, then the buy right housing is not something that, that the communities will scream about they won't be so afraid of by right because they'll know what it is that can be approved by right because they will have put together the plan that accomplishes that. That's really important. Um, we need to support them to do that. The other thing a community like mine needs where my closest BART station is about six and a half miles away, um, and it takes about 30 minutes to get there in the morning. Um, we are sort of on the end of the line, if you will. One of the things those communities need to meet the arena numbers is to get developers that actually wanna come. They come knocking, they take a look, and they say, forget it. It's not that they're afraid that we won't approve something. We can tell them what we wanna approve but they say, you know, the numbers really aren't there. You know, it's not really gonna pay. Yeah, we can sell them for a high price, but you know, it's off the beaten path. There's all these excuses. We've had, I can't tell you how many developers come, express interest, get all the way through entitlement and go, eh, I don't think so. Doesn't pencil for me anymore. It's like, okay, what makes that pencil? How do we come up with those incentives? The other thing we need is RENA reform. And I think um, the senator was correct. We do need RENA reform. Now, I don't know what he's looking at at RENA reform, but one of the things I've been beating on for a long time is that we need to look at having all housing count toward your regional housing needs assessment. 
all income levels. Yeah, they all count now, technically, but we get penalized if we don't get every single one of them in there. Frankly, existing housing stock can often count as affordable. That house that grandma's been in since 1964 and it's never been updated, technically in my community, that's a more than affordable house. So I understand, I understand, and I'm just gonna wrap up by saying I'm hoping that someday my 12-year-old grandson can afford to buy a house in the community he grew up in. I'm completely okay with that. I want to thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to serve on this body. I associate myself with all of the comments that have been made previously. My name is Keith Carson. I'm from Alameda County. And I say I associate with those comments because Alameda County, uh, with over 800 square miles, uh, has rural, urban, suburban areas, and we've experienced this. Um, Alameda County residents already know there's a crisis. That's why we voted earlier this year for a $580 million bond. I'm hoping what comes out of this process, uh, one is that the technical committee will come up with best practices um, that uh, exist already around the world and in the United States that we might be able to consider and look at here in order to push the envelope even on those best practices. I'm hoping that we look at, which is what we're gonna do in Alameda County, uh, all facets of addressing this crisis that we have in our area. That's preservation, and I appreciate the three Ps that uh, was laid out by Fred, uh, keeping people in their homes and being able to figure out a mechanism to do that, to make sure that we uh, provide shelter for individuals who need it, uh, workforce housing for individuals who need it, um, tiny houses if, that is, if that's appropriate, uh, um, uh, all of the forms of housing that allow people to get in it. We have the money, we wanna be able to leverage that with the best practices, and that's one of the reasons why we're here. After that, we're gonna to have to market this issue and get in our community and go ahead and have the fist fight uh, that we normally have to have when people don't wanna change things that go on in their backyard and their community and come up with a way of approaching it. Uh, but I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, my name's Kofi Bonner. I'm the regional president of Five Point. Five Point's a California developer. We've, we have about 50,000 homes in California that we're, we have the privilege of building and planning. As the president in, uh, of the Northern California region, I'm fortunate enough to be working in the cities of San Francisco and uh, the city of Concord. And uh, I certainly believe that uh, all the comments are absolutely uh, appropriate. I, I, I do want to say very uh, quickly, though, at the end of the day, it just takes too long to entitle uh, homes, takes too long to permit them, costs too much to build them, and that's part of the reason that it costs so much to sell them. We just got to bear that in mind. And, I, and in the interest of time, I'll just leave this with you. If we had a billion dollars today, you could probably build maybe 1,470 homes or so at about $700,000 per unit. And if you're lucky and you get 50% financing, double it. So you're almost at 3,000 homes. Just think of that. And if we can begin to beat on that, perhaps we'll make some movement here. But I appreciate the opportunity to, to participate. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Matt Franklin. I'm the president of MidPen Housing. We're a nonprofit affordable housing uh, developer, uh, owner, and manager. Uh, and we work in uh, 10 counties in Northern California. Um, I, I just very briefly, for the last 20 years, I've had the great privilege to be an active part of the ecosystem of the sort of small and mighty folks, uh, mighty group of folks who've been banging away on trying to produce uh, affordable housing in the Bay Area. It's a, it's a system that I will tell you is the envy of the country. Uh, Mid-Pen Housing, Bridge Housing, Mercy Housing, EAH are some of the biggest and most impactful organizations in the country. We were the fourth largest uh, nonprofit producer of affordable housing nationally last year at MidPen. Uh, the currency of our trade is partnerships with cities and counties. And I sit here and think about, you know, the amazing uh, leadership we have. Supervisor Cortese just 
championed a billion dollar bond for one county. The last thing the state did before the current bond was a $2.8 billion bond for the whole uh, country or the whole state. Uh, Mayor Lee had the courage to take over his housing authority and preserve those threatened units that I don't think any other mayor in the country uh, has done. And Mayor Schaff is uh, showing a lot of courage and creativity tackling the, the really thorny homeless problem in, in Oakland. Uh, so, so we're blessed in so many ways in the Bay Area, and I'm sitting here thinking it's just not nearly enough. So if I have one objective for this, I, I, I uh, have so many friends and partners in the corporate world and the business world in other parts of civic life who I think really feel this issue and really care about this issue and I think are having trouble finding a way to truly engage in this issue. And so if there's one thing I would try to challenge us as a group is to think about these solutions in the context of how do we create an avenue for other stakeholders, those who have the workers and the constituents who are ahead of us on this issue, I think, how do we create the frame so that they can get engaged in a, in a really meaningful way to bring their talents and their resources to part of the solutions of the problem? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Matthews with Facebook, and I'm delighted to be here. I was actually in a very good mood until Kofi ran those numbers. Um, as true as they are, that, that's stunning. Um, to that and to the goal that was mentioned that Michael mentioned in terms of the, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the great and, and I think it was Dave talked about the scope of what we have to do. This is a st region and a, a state that has done historically remarkable great things and we're at that point where we need to do look at this opportunity is to do that kind of scope. And so that's what I'm hopeful for here. Uh, two quick points on a couple of things that people mentioned that I thought I, I do want to underscore. Um, Mayor Schaff, you talked about how we talk, the messaging of how we talk about it and not think about brick and mortar. And, it's in, and I completely agree. We almost need to talk about it as homes, not housing. Literally the home and family, as has been talked about. Um, I would also suggest that um, what a couple of folks mentioned in, in terms of the scope of Coming from tech, everyone thinks, you know, we're part of the engine that's grown this, but it's also every aspect, not necessarily our employees, fellow employees, but every piece, whether it's the carpenters or the home care workers or everyone else or the restaurant workers, they're part of tech or part of this community, too, and we need to think about it in those ways. So thank you. Um, I'm Rebecca Prozan with Google. Um, I am taking the role of being the next to last person very seriously. Um, and uh, I think uh, to um, look, the status quo is not working for anybody. It's not working for uh, nonprofits. It's not working for corporations. It's not working for public servants. It's not working for the American dream, which is to be able to own a home wherever you want to live. And um, I always look to meetings like this the first thing I always do is say a year from now, what would we want to look back and say, those are the things that we know that we can agree on and do together. And so my hope is that a year from now, we actually can agree on those things and have an action plan where we can all execute it all as one big, uh, one big happy family. So um, let me thank everybody for your comments. And uh, Ken and I have been taking notes, and we wanted to do a summary, but we're running out of time. Uh, so I, I only want to maybe just pull the thing that I, I think was most impactful, and everybody agreed, and give a little credit to Dave Regan, who said, you know, we, we need order of magnitude solutions. And I think what we heard is a lot of support for the three Ps and, and a lot of sensitivity to the complexity of all this. Um, but I do want to uh, acknowledge the time constraint. I just want to take one second and say that behind these co-chairs uh, is a support team. Uh, the MTC staff is led by uh, Ken Kirkey, who's the planning director, and there are a couple of, of consultants. Uh, we have Carol Galante from the Turner Center at UC Berkeley, and Miriam Zuck, I believe you walked in. There you are, hi, um, from the Urban Displacement Center at, at UC Berkeley, and then my firm, Estelano Lasar, is providing the facilitation services. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll uh, stand up. Moving targets are harder to hit, right? I, uh, I want to begin this presentation with an apology. Um, this is your first meeting. 
Uh, we normally don't do business by punching somebody in the nose <laughs> in the first meeting uh, and presenting them a brand new idea, really without context, without a whole long list of alternatives. Uh, that's not how we do things, but uh, we've got uh, an opportunity on the table that needs quick action if uh, you're going to want to have anything to say about it. Um, and so I want to describe for you uh, what this idea is, and there will be no hard feelings if at the end of that you put your hands up and say, too much, too fast, uh, let's let this process run. Um, but the particular idea that is on the table is as a result of the increase in the state gas tax, which has injected lots of new revenue into several new programs, and one of them may be germane uh, to the discussion you're having today. One thing we do want to talk to you about uh, all the way through this process is the extent to which MTC's funding resources can be better integrated to not only achieve transportation outcomes, but the housing outcomes that we're all seeking. Uh, the commission is already headed partway down this road. This would be going further down this road, and I think the further you get down this road, uh, the tougher the going is. So let me describe it to you in brief, uh, and certainly welcome your questions, and we're really here today uh, to ask for your advice about moving forward. Um, we'll be presenting some version of these ideas to the Commission actually next month, which is starting next week. So next slide. MTC has for several years now had a history of trying to better link our transportation investment decisions with housing. We've done it in a number of different ways, some of them more, some of them less popular with the Commission itself. Uh, the first one I'm showing you is instances where we have directly invested our transportation money in housing. Uh, it's tended to be in uh, programs that have these cute little acronyms. There's TOA, there's NOAA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I will say that I think the Commission has been willing to engage in piloting these ideas, but at this point is probably not willing to take them to scale because for the obvious reason, we've got a lot of transportation needs in the Bay Area, and uh, if we're gonna start to poke a hole in the transportation boat and move the money over to housing, then we might have done some good for housing, but we haven't done some good for transportation. So I think what we have done here, which has gotten us a bunch of leverage, as you can see, five to one, sometimes even more, uh, it's a good use of, of funds per se, uh, but I think the concern the Commission has had is that we need to keep transportation money flowing primarily to transportation investments. That's not the end of the story though. Next slide. I think where the Commission has had quite a bit more comfort is on the idea of conditioning transportation investments to achieve housing outcomes. Uh, the most, uh, I, I think, uh, noteworthy example is something we call OBAG. Uh, which is not ABAG's Irish cousin. It's actually the One Bay Area Grant Program. And that program has within it both a carrot and a stick uh, to try to achieve better housing outcomes. The carrot is that the money is distributed around the region based upon housing production. So if you build more houses in one cycle, you're going to get more of this money in the next cycle. Um, and so it has that built-in incentive uh, to try to encourage communities uh, to go farther. But it also has a stick. And the stick is that unless you have an approved housing element from the state of California, uh, you're not eligible for these funds at all. And in fact, when we started this program, there were about 20 cities in the Bay Area that didn't. And uh, about a year after this program took effect, there were zero. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty clear case of that linkage being direct and that linkage being successful. Um, we have also started a program, uh, we've capitalized it, we haven't actually uh, uh, begun it because it relates to a deadline in the future. And that's the second item you see on this slide, which is 80,000 units by 2020. And the basic idea there is it's a race. All the cities in the Bay Area are entered in the race. Whoever the top 10, whoever gets to 2020 with the most, you get some of this money. That's the basic idea. Uh, and again, that, that particular program is limited to the top 10. So not everybody wins, 
Uh, only the, the first 10 finishers win. So that is a place, and this is sort of the model for the conversation that I want to direct you to now, which is this new opportunity. Next slide. Uh, Jake McKenzie, I think, was referring to this, uh, and this is the production. Uh, th this is what RENA was asking us to do, the regional housing needs allocation, over the last two cycles. Cycle three, which ended in 2007. Cycle four, which just ended in 2014. You can obviously see the huge dip that we had in the, in the fourth cycle had to do with the recession. Um, the interesting thing, though, is really in the bottom of the chart. Uh, the average production rate for all Bay Area cities for low, very low, and moderate income housing, based upon their arena promise, their average production was 41%. That's the average. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I went to school, 40% was, was an F. Um, so uh, what we're talking about here is different grades of failure. And what we have in mind for this idea is, is there some percentage below which folks should be ineligible for certain funding, uh, similar to what OBAG said. Now, what OBAG said is, if you have an approved housing element, you get the money. And when you think about it, that's a pretty low bar, right? Because an approved housing element is required by state law anyway. Um, this really, the idea I'm going to present to you, goes a step further than that. It says, going beyond the promises that state law requires you to make, how much have you actually produced? Next slide. Now again, as I said at the outset, our preference is, and we're still going to do this, uh, that we take this issue systematically, that we look at all the various fund sources that MTC either controls or doesn't. Uh, we talk about how all of those might play a role in the housing question, but because of the timetable that we're on, and I'm glad he's back. Uh, Bob Alvarado actually will be a decision maker in this process because he's a California Transportation Commissioner as well. And this particular fund source is the fourth one from the left called the State Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP. Obviously, you could see a couple of bars to the left of this chart are much larger than the STIP. And so this group should spend quite a bit of time talking about those. But the STIP is the fast-moving train right now. And MTC has to submit a program uh, for those funds to the State Transportation Commission by the end of this calendar year. So it's very quickly. And that particular opportunity will be about $300 million. So it's not a small amount of funding. The reason I'm here to talk to you about it today is if we miss this opportunity to have this discussion, we're going to wait two more years before we can have it again. Um, and so on the one hand, I, I felt poorly about bringing this to you at your first meeting. On the other hand, I felt poorly about you missing the opportunity even to talk about it at your first meeting. And by the time you're done, it still won't be time to talk about the next cycle. So uh, warts and all, we're here with the idea. And what you can see here, these are annual funding increments. As I said, uh, the, the funding opportunity for the STIP that is coming up uh, is round about $300 million for the Bay Area. Next slide. So I've got two questions for you. And obviously, I'm skipping a whole lot of detail. Um, and that detail will be something that the commission, and there are several commissioners who are here today, um, they will be digging into this in detail. But I think it would be valuable to hear from this leadership group about what you think about two ideas. And here again, I, I want to give you sort of a carrot and a stick. And people do tend to like carrots a lot better because, I mean, you can eat a carrot. Uh, a stick doesn't taste very good, and it doesn't feel very good to get hit with one either. Um, but what we have found with the OBAG program is that the combination of the two, an incentive and a disincentive, was more powerful than just the incentive all by itself. The incentive idea is the first question. You know, that challenge that I mentioned to you earlier, 80,000 units by 2020, well, what if we added some more money to that? and made that challenge more valuable? Would that encourage more behavior? And we might want to keep it not the top 10, but maybe the top 15. Lots of details, lots of ways to slice and dice. But the basic idea is, should we increase our commitment to that pool of funds? And as it turns out, the State Transportation Improvement Program, the STIP, 
mon the money typically comes in county silos, and you sort of have to spend it in each county in the Bay Area. Bob's very familiar with this. But because of a unique set of circumstances, there is actually about 50 million bucks in the next STIP cycle that has MTC's name on it. It doesn't have an individual county's name on it. And so we really, our commission has the discretion to decide how to expend those funds. And our idea is that they continue to spend them on transportation. That's not the point. But that they be awarded based upon the housing production of the cities that do the best in the region, whether it's the top 10 or the top 15. That's the carrot. The stick at the bottom is the second question, and that is whether we should withhold funds from jurisdictions that are producing less than some kind of specified threshold uh, of their arena numbers for low, very low, and moderate income housing. You remember I mentioned that the average in the Bay Area the last two cycles is about 40%. So if we were to pursue this second idea, it wouldn't be at 40%. Certainly wouldn't be higher than 40%. It would be much lower, say at 10%, which would probably capture about 10 or so jurisdictions in the region based upon our preliminary analysis. But the policy question there is, is withholding money appropriate in the case of those jurisdictions that are producing so much less than even the regional average, which is so poor to begin with, uh, that some kind of ins disincentive to go with the incentive at the top should be considered. So I realize I've just hit you with a fire hose, um, and I again apologize for that, but I, I did think we owed it to this committee, since you are meeting and you're meeting while this opportunity is available, to give you a chance to weigh in on it. So, Bob, I guess you're first. I have, I have a couple things, and I just asked Alec. Um, I think you need, you need to, and I know we're under a time strain, believe me, um, but I think you need to be careful. A um, couple things you got to look at, and we want to look at everything globally. Okay, first, very simple, we haven't talked to staff yet at the CTC. Um, so then I'm curious, if we haven't talked to staff, we probably haven't talked to the two transportation chairs. I think we need to have that conversation so there's no pushback um, from either of those three, those three folks. Globally, um, I think if you go to the stick, um, coming up here pretty quick, you know that the, uh, uh, the tax increases are being challenged two, th two different ways. One, the assembly, assemblyman, and two, by the national party. Um, and then you've got several self-help counties coming to the ballot in 2018. If, if you adopt this, are you feeding that anti-movement? You know, we just, we barely made it in, uh, in Alameda County. We had to come back. We just lost by a few points. Um, but if you look at Alameda County and you look at those jurisdictions within Alameda County who may have um, issues with growth, and they have no way to get access to this money, what's the incentive to vote for uh, an extension of the self-help? Um, on the other hand, if you look at, um, not just the self-help, but if you look at areas where, um, where the initiative's gonna come, I mean, where politics are at a point now, they're so sophisticated that if I'm running the opposition, first thing I do is run the, the cities and, and counties with, uh, with growth issues on both sides, not enough growth and too much growth, and I target those issues with my campaigns. And now you've lost the SB1 money. So I, I know we're under a time constraint, but sometimes it's, it's best to make sure all your ducks are in a row. If you've already done this, I commend you, um, but that's got to be part of your presentation. If you haven't done it, I, I think, I mean, no, knowing uh, the issues that we face at the commission, again, when you, when you come through and you punch somebody in the face and nobody's been prepared for it, it's like, no, no, we want to know more about it. And um, with the money that SB1 is generating, uh, we're actually um, condensing the STIP cycle. We've already done it once this year. Uh, to add more projects to the STIP. We, 
we've um, we went as far as to um, defund projects or, or remove them from the STIP with prejudice, which means they don't have to start over again. We just add them to the STIP as the money's coming uh, coming forward. So I, I would just be because I spend a lot of money supporting these the bond measure, and I spend spend a lot of money on each of and every one of the of the uh, of the self help county measures. I, I'm I'm curious and concerned. I guess is what I want to say. So, I I mean this um, absolute. I'm not trying to be snarky or facetious. I think in th theory, at the margins, it matters. In practice, I'm totally agnostic, and I don't think it matters because it doesn't come anywhere close. You know, we're talking about $300 million getting leveraged in a nine-county area, and back to Kofi's comments, these, these numbers are totally de minimis. And that's what I worry about. A body like this, we're going to take up lots of time about should we, to use Bobby's word, punch someone in the nose or not over $300 million. It doesn't matter. We, we have an order of magnitude problem, and if we ever, I don't know what the decision-making framework is. I'm totally agnostic on the question as a practical matter because it's, we, we have to get beyond talking at the margins and get to the scale of something that, ab, you know, that matters. And, um, and I, in theory, I'm for holding people accountable, but 10 jurisdictions and a couple of hundred units and a lot of, you know, in a lot of consternation and fuss, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. We got to think about bigger solutions. How, I, how are you calling I, on people? Pipe in, just uh, I'll, I'll turn. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll defer, Libby, if you like. I, I just want to interject just um, sort of same argument, alternative way of looking at it is that $300 million isn't going to go very far, but I think the fundamental question here is do we start leveraging transportation money in this way? And once you, once that becomes the new normal, <laughs> then I, I don't think it's a question of, you know, whether or not you go beyond $300 million. And I'm speaking as an MTC commissioner as well. Um, if, if once we pass that sacred cow <laughs> issue, um, and put it in the rearview mirror, then it becomes okay to go to whatever the next number is, whether it's a billion or two billion or five billion or whatever. I think there's just a fundamental question from the local government standpoint is um, how upset do local governments get who don't really want to do their housing element um, when you start conditioning money this way and do we care at the regional level or, or is this going to be one of those big ideas that we're willing to fight for? That, that's just another way of looking at it. Mayor Chef. So I like this. I'll just put that out there. Um, but th then again, I've been kind of fighting the good fight at MTC, as my fellow commissioners can attest. <laughs> because um, while Dave is correct that this is not an order of magnitude solution, I don't think that we're going to solve this problem with one magical order of magnitude solution. It's going to be 30 different solutions that cumulatively create that order of magnitude. What I think is important is that we start to drill home in our policy making, in our discussions, that housing and transportation are inextricably linked. And um, again, I actually want to um, commend Dave Cortese, who did what many tried to do in the past, but he actually got done, which was to actually finally merge ABAG and MTC, and it's one of the few regions in the, the country that didn't have a combined land use and transportation planning body. So we're at least on a path. But I think that this is important. It's an opportunity for us to, again, start that culture of looking at these two things as related to one another. And the fact that one is a carrot and one is a stick, again, continues a philosophy that I think is good. Now, Steve, I think you scared people a bit um, with like how big the stick is going to be. Um, 
my understanding is this would probably disqualify a very, very small number of jurisdictions. And it could also be positioned such that this would be in effect, you know, you, you would have maybe an opportunity to correct, uh, you would have an opportunity to redeem yourself. So, you know, this could be done different ways, but I think this is an opportunity. I mean, we, we, we can't wait a whole year till we come up with our first idea to implement. Every day that goes by, this crisis is getting worse. We have an, uh, an exceptional opportunity. I think the staff has thought about this carefully, and I think this is a great chance. I agree with Bobby Alvarado. You should talk to the C CTC staff and, and, and start, um, you know, talking to other people and see what their responses are. But what are we doing here if we're not going to take some action and take advantage of a unique opportunity that we happen to have right now? Uh, Ellen. Um, just to piggyback on Mayor Schaff's comment, who um, actually championed uh, some anti-displacement um, incentives with the OBAG grant that you know, the Six Wins for Social Equity Network did a lot of thinking and spent a lot of time thinking through how those funds can really promote <coughs> anti-displacement policies at the local level. And I really encourage you to um, adopt those as part of the STIP funding also. Okay, uh, Julie and Jeremy, and, and then I just want to say we have five public comment speakers and we need about 10 minutes. So um, probably, uh, would you like to take these two speakers and then stop? Sorry. Thank uh, you. Who was that? Hi. Uh, was that Matt? Okay. So please uh, go ahead, Matt. Is it okay to take three more speakers and then we'll stop? Okay. So Thank we've you. We've got um, Julie, Jeremy, and Matt. You'll be the final speaker. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'll always take carrots if I'm eligible for them. Um, I have some hesitation about introducing sticks too quickly, that perhaps sticks could be phased in if they're necessary, but would like to suggest that um, as a municipality, um, I cannot force a builder to come and build something. I do not have that power. And we've been told by our builders that even though our home prices are rising more than 33 percent rises in rent um, that they can do better cost per square foot versus rent per square foot in other areas because they are getting more money south bay so i can't make those builders come build in my area without dollar incentives to get them to come build so i feel like i get caught in a catch-22 where i don't get transportation dollars because I haven't built enough, but I can't build more because I didn't get the grant money because I didn't have the transportation bus headways or whatever else it was required. So it really concerns me to look at whether we've created a cycle where the folks who aren't building can't start building. Um, so f for my two cents, uh, I love the idea that the funding is better integrated housing outcomes and not just transportation. That's fabulous. I'll take a carrot. I would like to be eligible for the carrot. Uh, I think that stick should be phased in depending on how well the carrots are working. Can Thank I just you. ask sure. a procedural clarification? You're not talking about disqualifying people from all transportation fundings. You're just talking about one small new piece of transportation funding that nobody had ever anticipated coming along. Is that correct? Yeah, th this proposal is limited to the STIP program, which uh, Bob can tell you, you know, several years ago used to be nothing. I mean, it was broke. And now it's been infused with this new set of revenue from the gas tax. Well, wh no, well whether they expected them or not, I don't know. Uh, it, it has been how many years since we raised the gas tax? About 30. <laughs> L let me just clarify, if I may. Uh, I appreciate the comment and the clarification, but but I would like to clarify that year after year after year, new money will come in, special grant money will come in, 11 areas will be awarded and they'll all be uh, Bay Area South. They won't any of them be North because we don't have the transportation system that 
makes the criteria go up for the housing money or go up or the headways, we end up in a bind. And I just want to be really clear about that. Um, even if it is one time special money, it happens over and over. Jeremy and then and then Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> I will try to be really quick. I'm not sure, still not quite sure what our procedure is here. So mostly what I want to do is just echo and amplify Mayor Schaaf's comments from a couple of moments ago. I, I think this is a, um, I think we should try this. Um, I think it's a good start. I think if we treat it as the thing we're doing, then that's not far enough for what Dave said. If we treat it as, um, as a first step, and I noticed the pie here on these slides, you know, showed a total of 916 million. Um, and to the degree that we can continue to move forward to link housing and transportation funding and make sure we're getting the outcomes and we're leveraging the money the most effectively we can, I think that's exciting and I think this is, a, like I said, I think it's a good start. Last thing I'll say on the, the carrots and the sticks and maybe a little bit to what Bob said, uh, you know, Steve, I would put faith in you and your staff to handle this politically right and whether that's with the CTC, I'm putting faith in you. So um, whether that's with T CTC or with local jurisdictions, I think um, with OBAG we've seen some uh, great outcomes uh, because there have been appropriate sticks in there. Um, so I'm in favor of sticks, uh, but I want to make sure this is something that gets us started on the right foot versus something we take a misstep and it sets us back, but I think we can do it. Just just a couple of quick thoughts. The, the, it, uh, I've been recently the chair of the nonprofit housing in Northern California, and we've had the occasion to poll in every county, all nine counties uh, in the Bay Area on these issues uh, several times in the last couple of years. And the voters are exactly where the mayor is. They think of housing and transportation together. I mean, all you have to do is go to a, any planning commission of the 105 municipalities in the Bay Area to see that in live action, but the polls show it too. Uh, we, we um, you know, the, I, I, th I think it's probably obvious to everyone, but, you know, the umbrella concept that gets us out of this dilemma is to address the jobs housing imbalance. We have to create housing where the jobs are, and we have to help connect where people live to where the jobs are. We, we have a transportation crisis. We don't have enough transportation dollars. So the dollars should be spent where the housing is being built, because that's where you're going to get the return on the investment. So it's a really powerful idea. Uh, and and I, I completely concur with the, the concept that there's a signaling aspect of this that, that could become, you know, a lot bigger by linking the, the, the dollars together. Thank you, so Matt. I, so Steve's going to wrap up. Um, we're going to go to public comment, and then the, the co-chairs are going to close us out. Well, so what I heard was unanimous direction to <laughs> – <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, look, I, I appreciate the advice. Um, I think it's a bit of good luck that Bob Alvarado is on our committee because I could get the advice from him directly. Um, and he's given me some good advice, so have the rest of you. Um, I, I do think this is an issue the Commission's going to have to wrestle with. Um, and I certainly hear, I think, one, one clear thing. Anytime I can help you, Mr. Chairman, I'll do it. Um, that's why we pay 100 bucks a meeting. Um, what? But, uh, the, yeah, you don't get that. Uh, the, uh, and, and look, we, we do have two separate ideas on the table, and I'm certainly mindful that the carrot goes down a whole lot easier than the stick. And, and look, the fact is there, there is more than one cycle of STIP funding. If, if we can beat back the repeal, there will be another and another and another. Uh, but I did want to give you a crack at this one because it's here. Um, whether it's here too quickly, I uh, will have to see. So we will certainly keep you posted as we process this idea through the commission, and we'll be reaching out and covering the bases that a lot of you suggested. Okay, so we are rapidly approaching 2.30. We have six comment cards, so if the speakers could be as uh, efficient as possible in sharing their ideas. First up is Pedro Galval and then Michelle Majid. Good afternoon, members of the steering committee. My neighbor, my name is Pedro Galvão, and I'm with the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Um, first, I just want to commend um, MTC for bringing forward a proposal that continues to link transportation funding to housing outcomes. I think that's the direction that the region needs to continue to go in. 
the One Bay Area grant program was very successful in getting 28 jurisdictions that did not have housing elements in place to adopt them, and we want to continue to encourage that. But to that end, we need to encourage good action for that cities can take over things over which they have control. One of those things is full compliance with state housing law. There are a number of bills that passed both in the last legislative session and will hopefully pass in the current legislative session that will require local action. Among these are ADU streamlining, um, ensuring that your housing element sites are actual housing element sites so that um, housing can be built there. So I would encourage that this funding be used to encourage cities to identify sites, for instance, that are real sites that have been appropriately zoned to accommodate housing. Um, I would also encourage that um, for cities that have extra incentives for housing in the right places like transit priority areas and the priority development areas that they be rewarded as well, like reduced parking requirements um, for, and, uh, for housing in, pla in the right places. Um, in general, I want to commend you all for having this conversation in your first meeting and I hope that we get to take up items like this in the future, so thank you. And after our next speaker is Lindsay Grandioso. Hello, um, I will try to be efficient, but I'm gonna prioritize equity over efficiency. Uh, I first wanna echo what we heard from multiple stakeholders. Uh, sorry, my name is Michelle Majid. I'm from Urban Habitat and part of the Six Winds for Social Equity Network. Uh, I first want to echo what we heard from multiple stakeholders, that housing should be imagined um, with people living in them and not just as units. Uh, we're in one of the richest regions in the world, so we should stop operating through a scarcity framework. We have the ability to house all our people, especially lower-income working-class families. Uh, this is really about a culture shift and rectifying decades of uneven distribution of power and resources and discriminatory policies in the Bay Area. And now to some formal procedural asks. So we think that by establishing big picture goals, CASA can frame the scope of the problem, establish ambitious collective objectives, and start to engage diverse stakeholders towards solutions. The Six Wins for Social Equity Network urges CASA members to include the following components in the CASA process to ensure community participation and help guide the year ahead. First, we urge CASA to share draft meeting agendas with committee members and community-based organizations two weeks before each technical committee meeting and one month before each steering committee meeting, and to provide an opportunity uh, for input from committee members and community-based organizations. Next, we urge CASA to dedicate one meeting of the technical committee out of the 11 and one meeting of the steering committee out of the four to hear from impacted community members before finalizing policy solutions. Alternatively, as we've done in the past, uh, we urge CASA to partner with uh, community-based organizations to plan a special regional forum on housing and displacement that specifically invites impacted community members to share their stories and solutions and require all steering committee and technical advisory committee members to attend. We really think CASA should emphasize people's everyday lived experiences uh, before just going straight into policy. Um, lastly, we encourage CASA to set aside dedicated committee meetings to workshop funding strategies and policies for each of the three P's, starting with protection. And we have some handouts for you all um, that sort of detail these specific asks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know this has been a long meeting, so I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, my name is Lindsay Gadioso. I'm a lawyer with Public Advocates, and I'm here with the Six Wins for Social Equity Network. And I'm really excited to be here for the opportunities that this process holds for the whole Bay Area. I, we heard multiple committee members today raising the importance of keeping people in mind and leading with tenant protections first. Mayor Strafe opened the meeting by talking about that. Um, Julie Combs mentioned it about leading with tenant protections first, and Ellen Wu raised it as leading with protections first and pe keeping people in mind. Uh, Fred Blackwell brought this up in the meeting, in the technical committee meeting this morning. And we had a discussion about uh, leading with protections first. And in, in keeping that in mind, I would urge the steering committee to direct the technical committee to adopt, formally adopt a protection first framing and to ask the technical committee to ask for tenant protection solutions first. 
Uh, this focusing on protection first not only more directly focuses on people, it also reflects the appropriate sequencing of actions. New housing production can take years to produce, whereas protection efforts actually help people today. Second, Dave raised the idea of order of magnitude solutions, which I heard echoed by many others. It's been a common refrain today. Uh, this morning at the technical committee meeting, we talked about adopting big picture goals for each of the three Ps that frame the scope of the problem and establish an ambitious collective objective for the committee's solutions to work towards. That would set a frame for achieving these order magnitude of solutions. The Six Winds Network has spent a lot of time over the past month crunching the numbers and looking at various research by MTC and other institutions. And we have, established, we have come up with three big picture goals for protection, preservation, and production. The first goal for protection is to protect more than 300,000 low-income renter households from displacement, which translates to about 750,000 people, by adopting incentives and requirements and generating 400 million per year. The second preservation goal is to take 66,500 homes occupied by and affordable to low-income renters off the speculative market and, to do so, and doing that to generate 500 million per year for 10 years. For production, to meet the region's need for 13,000 new affordable homes per year by adopting incentives and requirements and closing the 1.4 billion yearly housing gap. That's all the time, so I'm gonna wrap up, but I would urge the steering committee to formally adopt these three goals to frame what the solutions we are working towards. Uh, there's also a lot of academic research indicating that setting ambitious collective goals in team environments early on improves efficiency and motivation and leads to improved outcomes. Thank you very much. And the last three speakers are Stephen Levy, Tim Frank, and Fernando Marti. As in the morning, um, I don't represent a stakeholder group. Um, but for 40 years, my day job has been working with regional planning agencies here and throughout the state on documents like this. I'd like to see if I can bridge Mayor Scharf's emphasis on people with Dave Reagan's call for an order of magnitude. And I think the way you do that is to remember that equity and people are not just, even though primarily, low-income people. They are the people that Mayor Lee talked about, the public safety officials, firefighters in Menlo Park sleeping on cots. They are the PhD candidates from Stanford that can't stay here. They are the people that Mayor Licardo is gonna house for Google. They are the people that Leslie talks about for middle income housing. They're the people that Julie Pierce talked about of which I am one who was lucky to be able to downsize from a large house and stay in Palo Alto. If you expand the number of people who are in need of housing, you can get to an order of magnitude. You can't just do that with poor people, even though they might come first. If you get to an order of magnitude, then you have to be talking about market rate housing, okay? It's the most housing. Jesse James Rob Banks, that's where the money was. Most housing is market rate housing. Two themes from the, well, you want to solve order of magnitude, okay? Two themes. One, making market rate housing less costly to build. And you've got a ton of ideas about that. But if you want only expensive housing, keep all the regulations, keep all the fees, keep all the parking requirements, that's all you get. And the second is help cities fiscally. You want cities as advocates. Thanks. Tim Frank with the Center for Sustainable Neighborhoods. I want to thank Steve Heminger for bringing the, the no notion of actually using a limited number of uh, transportation dollars as both carrot and stick. I think that's actually something that could be tremendously helpful. We've seen how useful the OBAG program is, has been in getting compliance with the housing element process, and I think that we could do more of that. 
Um, as for whether we should just use transportation dollars as an incentive or whether we should actually deliberately use transportation dollars as, as an investment directly in affordable housing, I would love to see us actually do some of the latter. I think in the long run that should be something we should be thinking about. Because if it turns out that building a home in Silicon Valley is cheaper than building a freeway, to Antioch, then maybe we ought to be thinking about building a home in the Silicon Valley as a transportation solution as well as being a housing solution because sometimes the same investment can actually serve both ends. Uh, I wanted to, there's no segue here, it's just a seven talk topic I want to uh, comment on. I'm uh, um, looking at this challenge of how we make it happen. Uh, I wrote a comment letter on a draft EIR just uh, day before yesterday for a project in Berkeley. It's 300 units. It's right on top of the downtown Berkeley BART, which is actually one of the uh, uh, most heavily trafficked BART stations in the entire system. And this is exactly where the Plan Bay Area says we should be putting housing. And the draft EIR said of the alternatives considered that the no project alternative was the environmentally superior alternative. That is just intellectually unacceptable. It just do it, it, it doesn't pass the smell test. And one of the things we have to figure out is how to shape we, the way we use CEQA and if need be, change CEQA so that it is actually sending the right signal to uh, community leaders who are wondering whether to approve a project uh, to recognize that density in the right locations is absolutely the right solution. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Marti. I am co-director of the Council of Community Housing Organizations here in San Francisco. We are a member of the Six Wins for Equity Network. And I want to echo what uh, several folks have said before this. Um, I think what you will be seeing over the coming months or quarters, however often you will be meeting, um, is a work towards real solutions that look at housing outcomes around a number of types of of, of policies around production, around preservation, around displacement. And I think that it is very important for us to begin with people where they are, with communities where they are, and to uplift the question of displacement as primary in what we are doing. And I will put as an example of how we could begin to do that with a question that uh, Mr. Heminger put before you, right? Should we be linking transportation funding to housing outcomes that are not just RENA production goals, but that are actually dealing with the displacement impacts that come from transportation funding and from market rate housing. We know and the literature tells us that wherever there is transportation funding, there are unintended consequences of rising rents and displacement. We want transportation funding. We want more production. We want more market rate production. We want more affordable housing production. But as a prerequisite for that, we need to ensure that our communities, low income, middle income communities who are facing the pressures of rising rents are able to stay in place. And what does that look like and where does that look like is going to be very different. There's not a one size fits all. Miriam Zuck is here. Their project at Berkeley has done intensive study of where communities are facing displacement, facing gentrification, and are at risk of being moved out to the outer periphery and adding to our transportation problems rather than solving them where they currently are. So that's the one thing I think I just want to make sure that all of you, many of you have um, posited the importance of putting people first, and I think that means anti-displacement policies if we're going to maintain a diverse Bay Area. Thank you. Hi, Scott Lane here. I uh, never thought we'd have a challenge with New York City of who's more expensive. So yeah, order of magnitude moonshot is what I think of. Um, I think not only what can we do in 18 months, but what can, I think Steve mentioned, what can we do ongoing? What are the pilot exercises you can do in your community? Is there an emergency maneuver, something to do with earthquake preparedness to try to find solutions? So it's not just what's on paper, but what actually works. Uh, as we know, a lot of times it doesn't pencil out, frankly, because we can't get the financing. We need to reach out to the corporate VC, they're very wealthy to try to find out how can they participate. Every time I see these corporate campuses, we probably need to reinvestigate, do we still do corporate campuses or do we actually build them into the fabric of our urban villages? Uh, and do we distribute downtowns? Do we just have one downtown or do we have many downtowns? So once again, I think this is 
Um, 30 different ideas, someone said, I think that's right. It involves idea districts, which we haven't talked about. It involves people, it involves crowdsourcing, and it also involves the big elephant in the room. We need to get rid of the corporate loophole for Prop 13. The five to nine billion dollars a year is really hurting us every single year. Thank you. We're gonna turn it over to Mike Covarubias. He's gonna bring it home. So, uh, yeah, we decided for efficiency that just one of us would chat, but all three of us could have done this. Um, I think it's important to recognize that while um, we apologize early on, we, we try to get this thing going fast. We were a little bit sloppy on getting information out when we should have. We recognize all that. So going forward, we're going to try to do a better job of that because those are reasonable requests. Um, I am grateful, as all three of us are, to the members here. This is an extraordinary commitment of your time. We do not take that lightly. Uh, the fact that 17 out of 18 showed up today and most stuck it out uh, is, is a great sign to us that this is serious to you, and we take it seriously. There will be lots of tensions. There will be go for the big order of magnitude, and this morning we heard uh, low-hanging fruit. Right? So pick one. They don't go together. So that whether we go, uh, we were excited about Steve's idea because we thought, A, it was low-hanging fruit. We didn't have to do anything. It's there. Uh, B, it matched transportation and housing. I think that's why I joined this committee because I want to be involved in an organization that can match transportation and housing to solve our problem. So when it becomes an issue that that's not the way it's supposed to go, and I understand the politics, it's going to be something we're going to have to sort of work through. So, you know, in summary, we, we have said a lot of things. We're here to protect, preserve, and produce. I don't know in what order. I don't know which comes first. I don't know if they go together. I don't know who's going to feel the best after the first round of suggestions that come out. We did our survey this morning. But what I can tell you is the three of us are committed to trying to make it work together. We're committed to trying to get housing moving. Uh, another committee that talks about we need more housing is not what any of us signed up for, and I don't think it's why you're here. So we, uh, we thank you for coming. We're excited about this. This is a mess. It's a messy project. It's a messy situation. It's hard to do this. Uh, I, myself, am not used to the public uh, process, which Steve never told me about when we <laughs> got me to say yes. Um, <laughs> So, so you'll have to bear with me. Fred and, and Leslie are much better at this. But you can take for granted when we talk about this stuff, we want to get something done. We want to get moving. And so if we muss it up a little bit uh, from what you know, the process should be if we took two years, that's what you're going to get from us. We're going to try to push the ball up the hill, the rock. Uh, I doubt that we'll reform CEQA during the process. Uh, you know, there are some things that can't be done. We'll try to tweak it. But we, I just want to say in closing, we're really, really, really appreciative of your contribution. Everybody today was, was great. And uh, we'll try to, we'll try to um, get what you're looking for in those opening comments. So with that, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you whenever the next one is for the steering community in a few months. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.